I went and I studied abroad in Belize. Um, and it was one early morning. Um, I was on Southwater Key, which is a very tiny island. And I dove, I free dove on a reef. And as I was coming up, the sun was rising behind that coral reef. And it was as if God spoke to me and said, this is what you need to be doing. Um, and for me, I was like, okay, inanimate figure that I had never heard their voice before. You're talking to me, you know, like I had always believed in you, but I just, I had never experienced something like that. Um, and so I continued my studies and I did graduate research in school overseas. Um, and I was in Indonesia working with the Bajo people. Um, and this was where it was a full circle moment for when Hurricane Katrina happened um, and me seeing the disproportionate impacts on communities of color and other frontline communities. And I was seeing this internationally with the Bajo people. And I knew that I needed to be in climate change policy and advocacy, but I needed to head to the hub of policy and advocacy, which was Washington, DC. So here I am almost a decade later. Andres, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, great journey. Grew up, uh, as I mentioned, I was born in Bogota and, and spent a lot of time as well outside of the city, really enjoying nature, but also uh, my journey took me to, at a young age, to West Virginia, wild and wonderful West Virginia, for those of you who don't know. And that was at an amazing time where your parents would send you out the door and the morning and they say come back for dinner when it gets dark that's when you come home there wasn't an alarm clock or a cell phone ringing nonstop telling you when to come home it was oh it's starting to get dark we should make it back for dinner and so i spent my summers and a lot of my youth outside running through the woods trying on purpose to get as lost as i possibly could to figure out if i could find my way home going fishing you know, finding all these amazing things out in nature and spending just a ton of time outside. And so fast forward later on into my life, I had an opportunity to start working at Ocean Conservancy. And I said, wow, talk about putting some of my, my passion of, of nature, of ocean conservation, of all these wonderful things to good use. And I ended up there for three years and it was just such an amazing, wonderful time in my life. And after that, I went, continued on working for environmental organizations, which led me to Green 2.0, which is a wonderful combination of both my passion for giving those who don't have a voice or don't have a loud enough voice uh, that power, making sure that we all have a voice at the table, not just the seat making sure that we are all part of the movement, all part of moving forward together. And so everything from my time in Columbia to my time in West Virginia, my time at Ocean Conservancy has all led me to this, which also includes in every single step, this passion to help out uh, my colleagues, my neighbors, my friends, those that I don't know and those who need it the most. And so that's uh, how I got to where I am. Thank you. Um, my next question is open to any of our panelists. What are some of the things that BIPOC leaders can do to reach out and support young people who are interested in environmental careers? This is this is media. I I don't know. I don't want to make assumptions. I, don't, I also don't want to say how old I am because some people will be like, oh, she looked like she's 18 or like, oh, she looked like she's 35. So, um, but I will talk about my experience of um what kind of changed my what kind of like you know coming out of college you know coming from a farm worker community with a single mom who raised three kids on 13k I don't know how she did it because when I got older and I was like 10k is not enough for me um it just made me have a whole kind of different respect for my mom but I went to college and um you know I you know with with my background of being a farm worker kid myself I was like you know there's a lot of like injustice we face you know children in the fields there's all kinds of chemicals out there that they're getting exposed to like and this is like you know my mom growing up on the land where she could drink from the river she was just like what is wrong with this country like why can't you know you drink from creeks like why do people throw trash everywhere um you wouldn't you know she just had deeply resented that that was 
the reality she was raising her kids and so you know I went to college I studied environmental studies and Latin American studies um, to kind of bridge that work because college you actually get to study what you want coming out of college I didn't have a lot of connections you know like we from a community where everybody works minimum wage and everybody's in the service industry like I didn't have none of these like connections that my friends who have friends who know people at organizations who get them internships had I just went on a huge limb and put out my application for to work with earth justice as an intern I was like really bored I just graduated I was like um, I want to do an environmental justice internship. And that's what came up. Google's like, you shall go to the Bay Area. And the application was like, oh, we highly discourage people who are not from, we only encourage local interns because there's a housing crisis in the Bay Area. Um, and I was like, whatever, I'm going to apply. I'm bored. I might, I already have a cover letter. Boom, I'm going to go for it. And thank God that um, Becca, love and light to Becca Olstad, she called me and was like, hey, I know that the website says this, but I saw your application and your interview and you just like, I'm sick of seeing Ivy League kids throw th go through this office dealing with the issues that you come from. Like, and I know it's a big ask because you might not have a lot of money, but can you move to the Bay Area and will you be a comms intern? And I was like, hell yeah, I'm going to put some, I'm going to sell some cans. I'm going to sleep on my friend's couch in the Bay. I got a couple family in the Bay that I could just sleep on a couch for three months. And I did that. And out of that internship, I was able to, um, you know, I went to Green Latinos and I met other brown folks in the movement. And I was like, whoa, like we really out here. Um, and yeah, if, if, if I wouldn't have gone out of my comfort zone and like, if I would have been like, oh, well, I can't apply. Sometimes you got to, sometimes you got to argue, argue and like stick your foot in the door and be like, look, like, please consider my application. Um, because I really want to, I really want to be here and this is the work I want to do. So, um, that's kind of like something that older people can do for younger people is believe in that and like something that as younger people we can keep doing is keep asking for what we need even if it, that's not what they're saying they want um so that's a long-winded answer but does anyone else want to add to that really wonderful response all right um so you know, there's been somewhat of an evolution in sort of diversity, equity, and inclusion work, um, and many of you have been in your careers for a very long time. Um, so really wanted to hear from, from you all, what has that evolution been like for you? What have you seen change? Um, and sort of speak to that. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in here. I think the evolution uh, has been so interesting and so remarkable. I think that years ago, you had the same people sitting at the same seat or given the op given the opportunity to sit at that at that table and at the, and have a voice at that at that table. I think what we've seen recently, and it's in large part due to one all of the work done by by those who've been doing the work for so long to to get us where we're at but to the youth the youth has such a powerful strong voice that says we're not going to just sit here and sign a petition anymore we're going to be proactive we're going to stand up we're going to take action we're going to be proactive we're going to be in your face in your office in front of you telling you what's happening, why it's a problem, why we're not gonna take it anymore. And so a lot of, of what's transformed has been because of that youth, especially the diverse youth saying enough is enough. And because of, the, of that movement, that youth movement, uh, we've really changed quickly and, and accelerated the voice of the movement. We've accelerated who's talking about climate change and climate issues at the dinner table because now you have high schoolers and younger and college students sitting down at, at the dinner table and saying hey mom and dad like this is happening this is real you have to pay attention you have those same uh youth speakers talking with magazines using podcasts using social media just out there really expressing the change that needs to happen and so there is this 
two part one is uh, two parts of the solution. One is all of the work by so many people who have been doing this for so many years, but also this amazing, wonderful voice that the youth that the diverse youth has given uh, to environmental issues and environmental causes. Yeah, I, this is Nidia speaking. I just want to roll right off of that because there's been a tremendous evolution. Like I want to, maybe we can drop the report card from this year on the chat that Green 2.0 did this year. There's been a lot of progress from, the environmental movement has been traditionally very historically male and white. So white supremacy is a thing we are still dealing with in this space. Tokenization is a thing we are still dealing with in this space. So like we've made a lot of progress, but at the same time, like we continue to like face these issues of like, as you know, me as a woman, as a queer woman of color that comes from a frontline community, how do we navigate this reality while also not caving into like, you know, there's this other tendency of folks really like to tell us how to write and what to say and like correct us in a way that doesn't honor our tone that doesn't honor our expertise or our narrative. And it, you know, there's ways in which we could like, there's ways in which I've seen young people challenge that margin where we're using our social media platforms, we're using free platforms like Medium to put out what, what, like the narrative we want out there. And we're also seeing, you know, there's some nonprofits that like are well-funded that want to come and be like, oh, hey, now, now we want to talk to you because you got a buzz. So we got to be really careful as young people to believe in our narrative and our power and our strategy to also not turn, turn around and get tokenized with the illusion that now this org wants to be equitable, now this org wants to be inclusive and like be diverse. Thank you. Um, I was at the opportunity fair last night, so I know lots of folks who are in this room are, are on a job search right now, and so I think this question will be really important to them right now. Um, how do you personally assess whether an organization is the right fit for you during a job search? Jasmine, can you lead us off? Yeah, um, I think this is such a great question because um, for me, I analyze the heck out of each and every organization. I mean, I assess the organization's mission and values. I look at who the organization is directly working with. Um, what's the demographic makeup of their staff, their board, their leadership? Um, I wanna know what I'm getting myself into. And I think that's very important being um, a black woman and a BIPOC person um, because we're used to being the one or the one of two in a room. Um, and we need to know what we're getting ourselves into. Um, I think it's also um, reaching out to the connections that you have. Um, you wanna download, what's the 411 on this organization? Has your organization worked with them? Do you know um, who this person is? Um, and it's relying on your gut. Your gut is something that is going to carry you through your career. Um, if you get a yucky feeling when you leave an interview, go with your gut. Don't, don't be trying to test it out and say, oh, maybe I just wasn't feeling well. No, you felt like that for a reason. Um, take in the dynamics of the room. Um, many interviews, you're not just gonna interview with one person, you're gonna interview with several people and have a panel interview. What are the dynamics within, within that room? Whether it's in person, whether it's through Zoom. Um, are you picking up on some underlying dynamics? Are you picking up that they're not on the same page with where they're wanting the organization to go, um, the direction for this person in this new position? Um, ask the tough questions. Um, you want to know for yourself, is this a position that's going to be a linear placeholder or is this a position that's a stepping stone in your career? Um, that sets your own expectations and what you're looking for in an organization. Um, I wanna walk away from an interview where I'm feeling more excited than, than I walked into it. Um, I don't wanna feel like it's a waste of time. I wanna be able to know that I identified the gaps, um, which to me are opportunities. Um, and I wanna be able to know that I can go in here and I can level up myself, that team and the organization. Trishna, can you add that? 
I, I honestly don't know how I can follow that up because honestly, Jasmine, and that was that was the masterclass right there. So thank you for sh sharing that. Um, thank you. I have kids in the house, um, schooling from home. This is this is life. Um, to Jasmine's point, I have to say that I spend a lot of time actually investigating. Um, as a former journalist, I really do look at different sources as much as possible. I look at the makeup of staff leadership and the board. I look at the messages that they're putting out on social media. I look at what they're not saying as much as what they are saying, because there's a lot that you can read into that. Um, I would advise you, if you can, to reach out and talk to staff, current and former. And, um, you know, there's often lovely things written on organizational websites about values and culture, but a lot of it is unspoken and a lot of it is untaught. So you have to find the best ways to tap into that. And conversation is one way to do it. Um, I have so much respect for and appreciation for what Green 2.0 does in terms of the accountability and transparency work um, across a lot of environmental organizations today. And I think that that is absolutely critical um, because one of the things that I have written on my whiteboard up, um, at work in the before times, the office at the office, was the lack of transparency is a tool of oppression. And it truly is if you think about it. So I am so grateful for the work that this organization does to shed light on that. And, um, and I would encourage folks looking into organizations to to do that work and, and follow through on the due diligence. Thank you. Um, so we've been hearing from a lot of folks, especially recently on, on sort of how young people for starting their jobs have a very hard time finding mentors of color at their organizations. Um, would love to hear about the experiences you all had either finding or not finding people, which we hear often, who help support you in your own career. I, I was going to go negative for a second uh, and just say, because it's not all it's not all roses and daisies and all those fun things. But uh, I found that in a lot of organizations where the leadership is mostly or predominantly white, and it led to a culture that was not there to help me find or provide the mentorship that I needed when I needed it. So I, growing up or as my career evolved, I had to look outside of those areas and find the leaders and find those willing to be mentors for me. And so the one thing that I would say is if those mentors aren't currently at your at wh where you work, look outside. Don't be afraid to ask friends. Don't be afraid to ask someone for advice and don't don't be afraid to ask someone to help kind of be a mentor because the chances of them saying no are probably pretty slim and they must they might you know just be waiting or you know they're completely willing to help and it's just you reaching out and saying will you be could you help could you show me this can you talk to me about this can you help me figure this out and so I would just say to anyone out there uh, in the same spot that I was in as, as I was coming up, if those mentors aren't open in, in front of you, uh, look around you because they, they definitely are around you. They might not be in front of you, but that doesn't mean they're not in, 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 the, in the nearby uh, vicinity. I would add that mentors don't necessarily have to be someone who's in a higher position than you. Um, sometimes we can always be looking above us. And so going off of what Andres just said, sometimes people are beside us. Um, we all have our different superpowers. Um, that's what makes the world go round. And that's also what makes us stand out and grow. Um, for me, I've always had to go outside of the organization I worked with to have a mentor. Um, again, it's not all peaches and roses. <laughs> um, and Andres actually, is someone who took me under his wing when I got to DC, when we met each other. Um, so this is X years ago, cause we're not sharing our ages. And, um, <laughs> you know, was like, let me introduce you to, to here. What are you, what are you doing in, in your job right now? Um, we could not talk for a couple of months. He would send me a check-in. How are you doing? How's everything going? Um, how can I help you? Um, 
you know, a person that you connect with, whether you want to call them a friend, a colleague, a mentor, um, it's really about that genuine connection. And um, it's a healthy relationship in which you all are bouncing um, ideas, reflections, and, um, and growth areas off of one another. Um, we have to form our own communities. Um, that's our responsibility because if we wait around for communities to be formed for us, it ain't gonna happen. Um, you've gotta be bold and you, you've gotta ask um, for the help. Thanks, Jasmine. Trishna? Oh, yeah, this is such a great conversation. I just wanted to add a few things, and I'm sorry, I was a little bit distracted earlier on What with the littles running around. Um, you know, earlier on in this conversation, there was a question about what BIPOC leaders can do to reach out and support young people. What I want to add to that is that if you're in a position where you were seen as a leader, it is our privilege and our responsibility to be available and share what we can offer. Um, this is how we pull people up and along. Um, recognizing, right, like time is a finite resource. So it is our responsibility, dare I say duty, to um, set that time aside and to connect with younger BIPOC folks in the movement if they want to. It's, it's about investing in conversations and relationships. And frankly, it's like being open to inquiry and, and having honest conversations. And those inquiries can come any from anywhere. It's like from your know, LinkedIn, perhaps from this conversation, perhaps from Twitter. Um, and for the young folks, what do I want to say? I want to say, uh, be intentional about who you choose to reach out to. Be intentional about why you want to reach out to them. What the value that you think they will bring to your life. Um, don't pass up on opportunities to connect with people. Um, and I get like two Jasmines, but I can't think of anyone who does this better than Andres. He is so good at connecting and building relationships. And then the final word here is on, um, we talked about mentors um, and yes to mentors, yes to peers, yes to the ones above, but also to ones who are younger and, and then you and are coming up and coming along. I have personally learned so much from uh, my former Ray Fellow. I am honored to know her and I'm so delighted to see that she's here, Emi Okikawa. Um, I get so much value from our relationship and I thank you for all that I have learned from you. Um, and final, final on this, right? Mentors and then sponsors. Sponsors is what you need to be thinking about how you can actually gain access to the places where you can build power for yourself and for the work and the purpose that brings you to this movement. Thank you. I love that you just shared the sponsors, eh? Because uh, it's a two-way street, you know, like I'm thinking so much when I when I was younger, I'm not going to say my age, but when I was younger, it's like, you know, we're looking up, right? We're looking at who can we reach out to? Who can we, like, who, who can lend us a hand because we need it, right? Because these spaces have not been spaces where our people have, they were created by our people or where our people, uh, have you know had historical access to so in thinking about that um we have to see it as a never-ending circle where as we look for that mentorship and get access to new spaces how, what hand are we reaching back to the people that are in our communities it's a two-way street it's not just about i'm gonna get into this table i'm gonna sit on this table and look at pretty little me i'm the one, only brown person no we can't get comfortable with being the only brown person black person queer person disabled person in any of these seats that are historically and predominantly white not just white but one of the things that i have so much grief on is that sometimes our own people are not our allies our own people perpetuate whiteness perpetuate that feeling of they see you and they're like, ooh, that's a that's a competition. Like uh, I'm the only I'm supposed to be the only brown person in this space, and we can't move like that. That's how the white supremacist system wants us to move, and we see all kinds of people perpetuating that. We cannot move that. We have to move from a place of love and love beyond the internalized oppression that we ourselves have been harmed by and that sometimes perpetuate. So I'm gonna keep it real and say that I have faced a lot of grief around like looking at someone that I wanted to be my mentor, that I was like, this is an elder that can mentor me. And then they just, I was like, oh, actually you a wounded person that just got older and never actually learned, uh, sat with the question of who am I bringing up with me, right? 
I think Cardi B said that one, she had this one funny video, how like, uh, she's like, I don't want to be the only person paying for, for dinner, you know? I want my people to come up too so we can split the tab. So we got to move with that mentality of like, I'm getting in here, not for my personal interest, but so I can also break the door open to have my people come in. Thank you. Um, since we're sort of on the subject of uh, not peaches and, and roses, right? Um, how have you uh, handled microaggressions and not so microaggressions from your colleagues and supervisors? What advice do you have for navigating this without losing your job? That's just the honest truth, right? All of us need to still make a living after this, things like this happen. So what advice do you have for folks um, when you've experienced this? And that's open to any of our panelists. All right, I'll jump in here. No one, uh, you know, I think it's important uh, at all ages and at all levels to make sure that you understand the difference between aggression from a supervisor or someone uh, who might be your boss and feedback, because there's such a thing as good feedback and not good feedback, feedback that is meant to help you learn, that is meant to uh, teach you and help you in the right path. But then there's all, obviously the, the negative kind of connotation where someone's either trying to hold you down, push you down, not let you up uh, and, and really stop you from achieving what you're capable of at work. And so how do you stop that from being fired? Well, I think that you, I think first you need to figure out kind of what it is that the intention is by the person giving you this, this kind of feedback is Second, you know, do you take it? Do you run with it? Do you show them that you can work so much harder? But I do think that there comes a point in time, and I know that colleagues of mine in the past and other and others, including myself, there is a breaking point uh, where you say enough is enough, and this place, this work environment, this culture is not for me. And then you need you need to make a really uh, you need to make some tough decisions for yourself and everyone's got those tough decisions to, to make. As you mentioned, you know, there's rent due, there's mortgage due, you know, there's, you have kids, you don't have kids, you have dogs, you have cats. There's a thousand things that you have to think about and it's all different from person to person and from case to case. But you, at some point you have to come to that decision of if this is a toxic place for me and a place that isn't leading to me being successful, uh, do I stay or do I go? And do I find a culture that is going to be more open and more uh, willing to help make sure that I'm set up for success and set up instead of setting me up for failure? So. Jasmine, go ahead. Yeah. Um, this is this this question right here. It it was a trigger for me, um, if I'm honest, um, because. I think as BIPOC people, BIPOC leaders in the environmental movement, uh, the climate justice movement, um, life can wear down on you if you're being honest. Um, we are in this work because we are passionate about it, but when we go home, the work doesn't end because it affects our personal lives as well. Um, it can be very hard to go into work and your colleagues or your supervisors make some microaggressive statement towards you. Um, I will say that as I've gotten older, um, I have gotten better at not showing a reaction. It doesn't mean it didn't affect me, but showing the reaction. Um, and I would say that in navigating those moments, you need to have your tribe on standby and send them a little text um, did you know that this just happened? Go ahead and get it out of your system right away. You don't want to be carrying it because you still need to get the work done. Again, we have jobs, we have families to pay for, we got, you know, school, we got vacations, um, we have life to live. So you can't let it wear on you. Some people are just sad and they're unhappy. So they want to rain on your parade. Don't let them do that. There's this thing called imposter syndrome and this is a thing that has been put onto us. Um, and I will admit that when I entered this role, I experienced it a lot. And it was something that I had to put in a box on the side because the work had to get done. So even though I was experiencing it, I still was like, I can't focus on that. 
Um, and one thing I did, I was part of, um, I'm, I'm part of Belisha Butterfield Jones um, master classes. These are on Friday nights and it was great because it started during the pandemic and we were, we were able to have this community of women come together and talk. One of the se um, sessions was about imposter syndrome. And I actually asked the question about this and I was like, I'm struggling. Like, you know, I'm always having to not even say, this is what we need to do. And here's the backup information behind it, but then they want even more. Um, and, and why is this? Is this because I'm a black woman? Um, is this because it's new? I'm not sure. And what I was told is do not second guess yourself. You are where you are for a reason. No one else in that organization or around you worked, studied, researched abroad. No one else has done what you've done since you've gotten to DC. You're there for a reason. So people need to know that and people need to understand that. And whenever they're doing their little microaggressive techniques, that's just to pull you down. So right, you rise above it. You, you, you know, don't worry about people like that. You're, you're good. You, you have all of your skill sets. You have your superpower. Don't let people pull you down. We are here for a reason. Could I chime in on this? Uh, um, let me just start by saying, I, true story, um, I was complimented by colleagues on uh, how well I speak English. And to them, I said, wow, you speak it really well too. Um, <laughs> and then on a separate, separate incident, um, in a meeting, with other peers and leaders, someone corrected my English pronunciation to which I immediately said, I speak two other languages. I dream in three languages, so excuse me. Um, and, you know, just moved on. A um, Couple of things I wanna say about microaggressions because we as people of the global majority or BIPOC um, deal with it every single day. And one of the things that I have, let myself um, embrace is that I don't care about people's intent. That is not mine to carry anymore. I will tell you what the impact is and then you deal with it. Sometimes I may not tell people about the impact if it is to me personally. So that's one thing I want to, I want to share. I realize that there is, a, there is a risk. There is a risk for BIPOC people coming across and telling people the way that their microaggressions have harmed them because there are perceptions in the organization. There is great value put on being nice and kind and being seen as collegial. So there's always that risk. Um, but I will say that um, courage is a practice and it is again, especially as directed to other people, if you have privilege, um, white passing privilege, white privilege, positional power, Think about how your discomfort weighs against the injustice this person is facing. And think about whether you need to be speaking up and who you are shielding or sheltering by your silence. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Trishna. I'm really resonating with the courage is a practice. Um, as, a, as a, you know, Mujer de color in, in these spaces that often, you know, people be like, are you 18 or are you whatever? There's this like, people can't really tell depending on the time and place. But there is a, an understanding of like, un recognizing that we all have different positionalities, right? And that right now I'm young, I don't have a family. So I get to be more radical because there's less at stake for me. I get to speak up um, because I've always been an outspoken person from the earliest traumas that I dealt with as a child to like how I organize and why I organize. Whereas some other people, you know, don't always respond in that same way. So I think one thing that I've learned around um, like how to handle microaggressions is to um, ultimately ground in the fact that if this is a person that you love and respect, then you can take that feedback or or like you know take it seriously but if this is a person that is like you don't respect you don't have a deep relationship with and they're like creating these like micro messages that are aggressive and that are making you get in your head about whether you should be there or not 
it's really important to just like shield yourself, whatever rituals or practices you have, if it's prayer, if it's meditation, because it is a, it is a rough world out there. And there's a lot of people that got a, a lot of their own, like insecurities that they project onto other people. And like, we can't always be carrying that or let that like continue to trigger us easier said than done. I know, but like whatever rituals, whatever prayers, whatever ex like exercises you have, whether it's getting up and going to the gym, getting a punching bag to let that out, because that does impact our, our, we, I, we do have visceral like experiences in, in response to that. Like, like Jasmine was saying, like text your friends, like be witnessed in this, in this moment. And then like, go back in, like reground yourself and like why you're there and, you know, just start over and like, you know, refine as necessary. I don't know if I, that made any sense, but like, it's important for us to have practices where we're like releasing the stuff, reaffirming ourselves and why we're there and then like going back in. Oh, I think that made complete sense. Um, I'm going to follow up with this next question. I'm going to ask Andres to answer first. Uh, what are some of the best practices you've seen environmental organizations actually take in committing to DEI work? Well, that's a great question, uh, Adrian. Thank you for that question. The best, some of the best practices are those organizations that I've talked to, and I've talked to quite a lot of them, but those that transition from just talking about it to actually doing something about it. So those that are willing to put words into action, putting words into an actual uh, strategic plan, into a yearly plan, into a plan that's gonna move beyond uh, even that staff that's going to live as a principal of the organization that is there in print for others to see and take in. Uh, it's a lot, it means a lot more when an organization is willing to do this than when they just say, we'll just talk about it and we'll see what happens. Because I've also seen plenty of organizations that say, we'll see what happens or we'll get to it or sure, it's a priority, we're, go we're getting there. And as you can imagine, uh, no one ever gets there. When you put something in writing in whatever form it, it is, uh, it really makes it more, it makes the organizations have to deal with it and have to deal with it in a timely uh, uh, time. So uh, putting something in writing, uh, those are some of the biggest things that, that we always see. Uh, talking with, with staff and, and all staffs, making sure that you're taking time out of the organization to address what's happening or making sure that staff is feeling comfortable, that staff is, has an opportunity to ask questions, and it's less of talking at staff, and it's more for staff to actually have an opportunity to talk to one another, but talk to leadership. So some, a lot of times I tell the leaders that I talk to in these organizations, uh, just be quiet for a little bit and listen. Listen to your organization. Listen to your staff. Listen to your members, your volunteers. Don't be the ones talking at them. Talk with them and let them do the talking as well. Trishna, I know you wanted to add to that. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Andres, for sharing that. It has been my privilege to work with the Jedi Task Force at Ocean Conservancy, Jedi's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at Ocean Conservancy for a while. And um, speaking from that experience, I would say the best practices for an organization is really to, forgive the ableist language, but really is to walk the woke. I hear a lot of woke talk. And um, if, if you're not, if you're not, acting with transparency around this. I already said something about that. Being accountable and publicly accountable to what Andres was talking about, acting with intention for your staff and through the work you are hoping to do. And I will also say putting resources behind that work, like it's all just talk, right? If you don't do those things. So those are really, really critical. And I will also say that it takes a great deal of humility and courage for an organization to say, hey, we haven't been doing our best work thus far. Um, we have a lot to do, but we acknowledge, we acknowledge that this is where we are and we're committed to doing the work. It's really important and it's a really important external yes, but also internally for staff, because I will say that in a lot of environmental organizations, my guess is that 
your BIPOC staff and other staff who hold marginalized identities are experiencing your organization in a different way than your white staff. Um, so there is that and the challenge, and I, the challenge to organizations to think about how you can divest some of your power. Divest your power internally. Who are you elevating? Who are you retaining? Who are you centering in your work? Which is why I'm so proud of Ocean Conservancy's embracing of justice as a principle in the way that we do the work, um, because that is so critical. And I would say it is mission critical for environmental organizations. And I push back heartily on everybody who says, that's mission creep and it's not in our wheelhouse because it is 100% part of why we do what we do. Um, OC has been great, I think, in, in terms of investing in the work. And, and I'm so grateful that our board has actually put dollars behind it. We have, um, I think, a $2 million investment over three years for justice and equity. We are so delighted to welcome on board um, to the organization. Alexa Sutton Lawrence is our new VP for Conservation Justice and Equity. And a few months before her, our senior VP of People, Adrian Lofton. So putting those kind of positions and people in the organization really helps, I think, set an organization on a new track um, towards truly delivering on that commitment towards Jedi. Thank you, Trishna. Jasmine, do you have anything you'd like to add? I feel like they covered it, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna let it hold there. Perfect. Um, so what's the best piece of feedback or the bravest piece of feedback you've received or given to um, other folks in your careers? Well, I guess uh, unless, so, oh, Miriam, did you want to go? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I just, this question really just um, brings to mind um, my dear a former executive director, who's now an ancestor, Elandria Williams. I want to presence them because they're, they're an amazing, even in the six months that they were in my life, um, really changed and left a mark for me. And one feedback that I got from from E one time was like, I was like new, I had just joined People's Hub and, you know, was working really closely with um, with them on a lot of stuff, you know, E really struggled at the intersections of disability, um, justice, um, black liberation and like solidarity economy as a child of the civil rights. And I just remember one time I was just like getting in my mode and like sending all these emails and be really responsive. And I was moving to like towards the end. They were chronically ill their whole life. They were really struggling with how much they had been very um, like moved in a really ableist way, even as a disabled person. And literally told me, called me and was like, Nidia Alicia, like you need to slow down. Just give me one month to recover, to like heal. And then we could speed up. And she's like, actually, no, like you need to slow down for the rest of your life. Like you're not doing frontline work. If you don't respond to my email anymore right now with us, if you don't respond to my email, like nobody's going to die. They're like shift, like shift my girl, because you will burn yourself out quick. Look at me. Like I, I, I put myself through this same thing, the same way you're moving. I did that. That's why I'm giving you that feedback is you need to slow down for the rest of your life because this is lifelong work. And I was like, damn, like he really cares about me. And it's like, it asked me to sit with my ableist tendencies and the ways in which I value productivity more than the process, which is another way that white supremacy, like, we embody that or like that shows up in the work. And she was, he was asking me to like, and their pronouns are they, she, um, so that's why I'm using them interchangeably, but that was really deep feedback that I'm still trying to rewire my body as someone that comes from a working class where like, you know, like I, I work online and it's like, I don't feel physically tired. Like, like I know you're supposed to feel cause my people been like working the land. It's like, you come home and you're physically tired. I know what that feels like. And that's, not that's like a tr that's like a way in which I still sometimes want to respond to the work, but it doesn't always have to be that way. We have to ultimately take care of ourselves in doing this work. Yeah. 
Dennis, you want to add something? Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so much good advice there, as always. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Nidia. Um, no, I think I would just I would just say I usually try to tell folks not to try to change too much of, of who they are for someone else. Uh, make sure that you are you throughout. Don't change to be to for a job. Don't change because that's the culture you think you're walking into. Be yourself. And if they're not willing to accept you for who you are, and for your background, your diversity, and all the amazing things that you bring, and then they're not lucky enough to have you. So that's kind of what I wanted to say there. Thank you. Um, we're at our last question of the panel and would love everyone to respond. Um, how do you take time to practice self-care so you don't burn out? I know we've talked about this a lot throughout this panel, how much steam you could use dealing with all the things that are going around all the time. So what do you do personally practice self-care and take care of other people around you as well? I'll start. Um, I think if I'm being honest, I think it can be very hard to be a leader in an organization or of the organization um, and taking care of everyone else and then making sure that you're being taken care of. Um, this is something I'm dealing with right now. And uh, which is why I'm going on vacation next week. So um, that is number one self-care for me. Um, but I would say my weekly self-care is my community. Um, I have a group of girls um, and these are two other black women climate justice leaders, um, Heather McTeer Tony and Tamara Tolza Laughlin. Uh, we talk on a weekly or bi-weekly basis um, and can come to one another about any and everything. Um, and we all get it, you know, we all have at least a child in the house. Um, we have our partners, we have where we are running things, you know, in the climate justice movement, um, trying to figure out um, what's the next move that we, we can make um, for our community. And so for me, having those moments, and th that's something I can look forward to, like, oh, I'm going to be able to talk to them about this. Um, and then figure out your individual self-care self. -care self. Um, and this might be personal and like outside of the environmental movement, but people have to realize that um, you are first an individual and then, you know, you're a partner and then a parent and then, you know, your role within an organization. Um, you have to make sure that you are feeding into yourself um, because if you have nothing else inside of you, you can't give and you can't pour into anybody else. Um, so make sure that you take time for oneself. Any of our other panelists? Yeah, I'm happy. Uh, were you gonna go on this? Okay. Um, first of all, I celebrate you in taking your vacation um you better send us some pictures so i can vicariously live through you um i would say um that i i think the self-care well i don't see self-care as as just how do i explain it like my self-care is the way i approach it is through like community care because ultimately if i'm okay and my mom's not okay or my people around me aren't okay then I can't, it's hard for me to be okay. Like yesterday I was having a really hard day and I walk out to the kitchen. One of my community members was like, had this moment where they broke down and I got my healing through holding space for them. And like, cause through, you know, I started burning some medicine and saying some prayers and I was like, whoa, she needed this and I needed it too. So like a lot of the ways in which I, I would say like, um, I take care of myself is being in circle with people that love that I love and trust, keeping connected to my ceremonies, um, keeping connected to my spirituality that feeds my spirit and lets me show up in the in all in all ways, and um, incorporating you know that that co connection into into my daily life whether it's even just saying a, a, a prayer before i eat giving thanks for the farm workers giving thanks for the waters or if it's saying a prayer in the morning or sharing a prayer in the afternoon with my partner it's so important that we stay connected to um whatever god or belief that it extends beyond 
um, the three the three dimensions. Um, I super encourage that because it it feels like it's not a part of the work, but it's certainly a part of the work in my experience. Andres. No, I'm still trying to figure that out. So I'm, I'm gaining uh, lots of advice here from, from this amazing panel, but uh, hopefully next time we chat, I'll be able to, to impart some wisdom, but no, I, I, I'm still working on that part. Krishna, can you share? Always, um, always. One of the things that really resonated with me, Anuria, you're talking about productivity and the, the myth and the persistent myth and the push around productivity so self-care for me is really slowing it down to what you were speaking. And sometimes for me, slowing it down, it's just like noticing my own breath and my own body because I lose sight of that. I, I often find, oh, especially over the past year, I forget to breathe and it's all held up and, and it's all there. So just letting yourself breathe and he, like allowing yourself the luxury of breath and noticing where you are, that is wonderful. Another part of self-care, which I struggle with and I try to practice is letting others do for me. Um, I have been, as an Asian woman, um, mom, um, socialized to do for others constantly. And so to allow others to do for me is, is a challenge and also a blessing and a luxury. Um, so that's on a personal side. I also say that, you know, I, I like interacting with people. I get a lot of energy out of it, but God, I need to go into my cave sometimes and not talk to people and just lose myself in a book where I'm guaranteed a happily ever after um, because real life, right? Um, in, in terms of work, I think one of the best things that I have tried to do is, um, especially because of the Jedi work is, and recognizing that I am a minority in a majority white organization, it is understanding and freeing myself from the responsibility, and I put this in air quotes, of teaching people. It is not my job to teach people. It is not my job to be a truth teller. And it's certainly not my job to represent all Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, so, you know, those, those were realizations that have come to me really late. And, and I, am, I work every day at learning and unlearning. Um, and so those are my self-care practices and thank you for the opportunity to share that with y'all. Thank you everyone so much. We're gonna open it up to questions. Um, so if you have a question, put it in the chat box, please. We actually received a couple of questions on Twitter earlier today. So I'm gonna start with those and then we'll continue um, additional questions that you all have. Um, so the first question we have are how do you and your organization create space or opportunities for young BIPOC individuals to enter the environmental field? I'll go because I run a youth organization. Um, so um, we run a leadership development program. It's a three-tiered system. Um, we have field representatives. Um, these tend to be mostly high school students um, and a few college students who are just dipping their toes into the climate justice movement. Um, we then have our fellows um, and then we have field advisors who act as mentors. I am very proud to say that um, we have had several fellows who have gone through our program and then joined the team officially um, in a formal capacity. Um, my former deputy director, who actually just left a couple weeks ago for their dream role, um, was part of OCs as in our climate, not to be confused with Ocean Conservancy, um, fellowship cohort. And she actually was a fellow, then an intern, then a... Um, a program associate, program manager, and then the deputy director. Um, so we are truly walking the walk of making sure that we're uplifting our youth, or as I like to call them, our frontline climate warriors, and um, making sure that they're making those connections, um, not just internally, but externally, um, having them involved in those coalition spaces that we are part of, having them represent us at the meetings, not staff person. Um, making sure that when they get in front of elected officials, they're leading the meetings. Um, we are there just to guide them and provide them with the tools so they can go on to um, be those visionaries, activists, and leaders that we all need in our communities. Any other folks want to respond to this question? Andres? Oh, I'd love to. This is fantastic. So we have this amazing, amazing person who is our 
fellowship head and fellowship coordinator among many amazing roles. Uh, she's also our deputy director. Her name is, guess who? It's Adrian. Adrian is our fellowship head. She runs our fellowship program and kicks butt doing it as, as no one's surprised by that. So we have a fellowship opportunity. We have two fellows at all times for three months. We do the one of the most important things is we pay them. We make sure that they are paid. They get paid $6,000 for three months of their amazing time with us. We mentor them, we help them, we give them important work, uh, not just busy work. And the most important thing, aside from some of the things I've already said, is that we make sure that one, they are able to go to their next job interview with experience because so often you go into that first interview and they're like, so what, where's your experience? And you're like, well, I, I'm, I'm here trying to get some. And so one, we're trying to help that part out. And two, we're also uh, making sure that the work they're doing is something they can show to that employer. So when they say, well, show us some of the work you've done, it's not like, oh, I was picking up phones for the last three months. And so that's what I've been doing. Some of our past interns have helped with the Conference of Mayor writing resolutions. They've written blogs. They've run our blog program, you know, and we're, they've, they've, uh, they've been on the, they've been working with, with Adrian on doing Zoom Hill calls. And so, you know, depending on where their passion lies, depending on what they want to do, we really try to focus it, uh, focus a program for them within the three months so that they come out with all of these uh, wonderful tools. And so we're really, really, really proud of the program. I am extremely proud of how Adrian runs it. She just does an immensely wonderful job with that program. And so it's exactly what Jasmine was saying. It's walking the walk. We can't just expect others to do it. We need to be doing it ourselves. We need to be, as Nidia mentioned and Trishna mentioned earlier, we need to be making sure that we're looking behind us and making sure that we're bringing a bright, wonderful future. Because if we don't work and help youth who are passionate about environmental issues right now, they're going to put their passion elsewhere. So wouldn't we rather help them along so that they can be that passionate, amazing leader of tomorrow within this field instead of having them go elsewhere? So. All right, I'm jumping into the silence um, because I reject absolutely 100% that there's not, not enough BIPOC people in the environmental movement and pe people tell me, oh, the pipeline, please. I have strong feelings about that, clearly. Um, one of the ways that Ocean Conservancy has materially done something to bring and encourage BIPOC um, youth to enter into um, the environmental community and hashtag uh, no unpaid labor for BIPOC folks here. Um, it's through the Roger R. Liner Young Fellowship, which was started to honor the first African-American woman to earn a degree in zoology. Um, and over the past several years, a variety of different organizations have invested in this fellowship to bring talented, fantastic, young people through the organization who have had the opportunity to learn but honestly like our organizations have gained so much from their their gifts back to us so i want to say there are multiple opportunities open this year with the run Carolina Young, so you can go to rayfellowship.org. I think there are 21 this year, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and it is such a privilege to work with and learn from all these young folks out there. And I see, again, I want to call out, let me see, Kalina was here and Emmy was here. And I don't know if other Ray fellows are here, but you know, just gratitude and appreciation for everything that they do and the gifts they bring to all our organizations. Thank you. We have another question um, from Twitter is, how do you create a workplace environment that is welcoming to young BIPOC that will promote future retention in the field? Go ahead, so, Nidia. This is, this is Nidia speaking. Um, I, you know, I want to talk about this, this question particularly because at People's Hub, we're mostly 
uh, black, indigenous, or of color, or queer and disabled. Um, I think we only have one person that is um, identifies as white. Um, but the what we've experienced, give, and it's building a little bit on what Jasmine was sharing, is like we don't clock out of this work. <laughs> like we work on the work, and then when we clock out, we live the reality that we're trying to change so that's very different than white folks or wealthy folks who do this work and get to clock out you know there were some several times when i was an intern in the in the office at earth just to stay in over time because i was really passionate about getting this article out and people like go you know just just go home you're working too hard i'm like excuse me you not working hard enough to like solve these issues that are burdening my community so one thing that we really value um during our staff check-ins is check-ins like and letting those be times where we really just let people share what is you bring in to this meeting like oh you know because it, and and we're in the middle of a pandemic so like there is so much importance in that. And that is what personally has kept me there. Because going from a, a, an, a, an environmental organization where I just show up to meetings, immediately go into the agenda item, and I'm like, nobody asked me, but my auntie just died yesterday. Like, oh, you're, you're going through this. This is all going over my head because I don't even know how to process the fact that we're losing our elders at a rapid rate in the middle of this pandemic. And so that is something that I think we could be incorporating um, in whatever space you in, even just a quick check-in. One minute, how you doing? Put it in the chat. All right, great. Some of you are sad, some of you are tired, some of you are grieving. Cool, well, then that sets the tone for how you move through the work so that it's not like, today we're gonna tie. It's like, okay, somebody just lost somebody. We, we're gonna change the tone and we might only get through half of the agenda. Um, so that's something that I think is, is a good practice that has kept me at working with the org um, uh, right that I work with right now. Thank you. Do any other folks have anything to add to that question? Andres? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, totally agree again with media, but we really need to make sure that as young staff, uh, any kind, any any new staff come into any workplace that there are things set up there already that can be helpful to to making them feel welcomed that there are that there are that there's a handbook that really outlines um, where the organization stands when it comes to their prioritization of diversity what it comes for for their rights for an organization to really uh, start off when someone when someone comes in by really explaining and talking and being open about where where they where they have been where they come from where they're going and when it comes to talking about diversity when it comes to, to talking about culture when it comes to talking about what they can expect at the workplace and so i think that having all of those things ready and prepared for when folks are coming in i think can really help be a smoother transition than someone showing up and really just kind of putting their hands up in the air saying i'm not really sure what to expect um, out of anything here. Trishna, did you want to add something? Yes, I do. I want to say it is the organization's responsibility to be transparent, again, um, about pathways to growth and success and retention. I want to see that up front. Don't be hiding it and just don't like, you know, I, I want to know, like, what does promotions look like? How are you offering me opportunities? How are you measuring my success? How are you enabling me to succeed and have mastery over the job that you've hired me to do? All of that in one breath. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our last question from Q&A is, how do you process and pivot your, with your interests and work changing over time without losing sight of where, why you started the work in general? Andres? Yeah, that's easy for me. I, I just look at my kids every day and I look at the two beautiful women that they're becoming and how strong and independent and wonderful. And imagine a future for them when the struggles that I've faced or that others face uh, aren't there or lessened. And so when I look at them and I think of what could be, um, it really 
refocuses me every day and really gives me passion and gives me that kind of energy to go out and try to change the world and not only change it, but help accelerate the change so that they can have a life where those struggles aren't a reality uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, this is maybe I'll go right after you because for me, it's just I come home, I go home wherever, you know, and I that's the reminder of why I do this work and who I do the work for and it it fills my cup with love. I love my people. I love my community. I love Mother Earth and that fills me with love ready to go right back in. Krishna, Jasmine, do either of you want to add anything? I mean, I think you all heard part of our stories at the beginning. Um, that's our why, why we got into this work. And, um, you know, for me, I, I can connect with Andres on this, you know, it's looking at my little girl, it's thinking of home, it's thinking of everyone around this world. And, um, you know, yes, I'm a climate scientist and I'm an advocate. Um, and I know that my superpower is striving to raise awareness to the disproportionate impacts on communities of color and being able to break down that information to an abundance of audiences and say, we have to care about this because this is, this is our end all be all. Um, you know, climate justice work, we are fighting for all social justice within climate justice because everything falls under climate, uh, climate justice. Um, if we don't have social justice, if we don't have racial justice, we will not achieve climate justice. Um, and, and so it's very much um, it, it's very much about your why. And if you keep your why close to your heart, then you're 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 always going to be good. Um, you're always going to know during the tough days and the hard times um, that you are trying to leave your footprints on this earth and make an impact. Um, it's about making a legacy with your community um, and affecting change on a daily basis. Jasmine, I think there's no more beautiful way that we could end this panel than what you just said. So um, Trishna, Jasmine, Nidia, Andreas, thank you so much for your time today. I am so appreciative of your honesty and just your intentional perspective. So thank you so, so much. Um, to everyone in the audience, I think all of us are willing and would love to connect with each and every one of you. So please reach out to us. I'll put my email um, in the chat box as well as our website. So please reach out to all of us. And I just hope you all have a really great rest of your week. And thank you again for your time. Take care, everyone. <laughs>